Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, thanks for being here. And please, um, as we proceed, avail yourself of the hospitality, um, uh, cookies and coffee and so on. Um, Father Scannoni, you'll have to, we'll have to maybe FedEx you some cookies and coffee. But uh, well, uh, can can you hear us? Are we are we live? Okay, maybe not. We'll, we'll have, to, have to check it out. Well, um, I'd like to introduce the three speakers that we have for this session. Um, Father Juan Carlos Canone, Jesuit, is Professor Emeritus in Theology and Director of the Institute for Research in Philosophy at the University of Salvador San Miguel in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, he's a well-known figure who's served at many, uh, as a visiting professor at many different universities, uh, Frankfurt, Salzburg, the Gregorian in Rome, the Ivo Americana in Mexico City, Alberto Hurtado in Santiago, Chile, and uh, many other places. He's the current director as well of the social ministry of the Diocese of San Miguel, so he's not just in the library, he's also uh, dedicating his weekends to working uh, with those in the diocese's marginalized neighborhoods. He's uh, well known for having published eight uh, books and uh, edited many others and written many uh, different articles. So we're very pleased to um, be uh, 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 in uh, communication, virtual community with uh, Father Scannone today. And we're hoping that the technology will, will serve us well. Our second speaker is uh, Matt Ashley, the uh, chair of the Department of Theology and associate professor at Notre Dame, uh, got his PhD here at the University of Chicago and has written uh, on political theology, liberation theology, and is an expert on the theology of uh, Johann Baptist Metz, whose name keeps popping up uh, today. He's written uh, one of the really important works on Metz uh, called Interruptions and has also uh, translated several works of Metz as well. And our third speaker today is Michael Lee, Associate Professor of Systematic Theology at Fordham University in New York City. Um, and he's also in the Institute for Latin American and Latino Studies at Fordham. President-elect of the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theologians in the United States, uh, on the board of directors of the CTSA, the Catholic Theological Society of America, and author of a very fine book called Bearing the Weight of Salvation, the Soteriology of Ignacio Eacuria, who was one of uh, Father Sabrino's uh, housemates, um, uh, who, um, whose anniversary, whose death anniversary we celebrate uh, today. Um, so um, I will turn it over to Father Scannone. Buenas tardes a todos y todas. La presente exposición se enmarca en la conferencia Testimonio, Profecía, Política, Sabiduría. Por ello, escogí centrarme en el rito del Tingunaco, porque constituye un testimonio de la sabiduría popular latinoamericana, una especie de teología política de acción, en acción simbólica que, si se la sabe interpretar, implica un, un fuerte contenido profético y una vigorosa interpretación ético-política. Además, dicho rito, que se practica anualmente en la ciudad y provincia argentina de La Rioja, se conecta estrechamente con el testimonio de sangre de Monseñor Enrique Angelelli, obispo de La Rioja, quien celebraba el Tincunaco interpretándolo en su prédica a la luz de la teología de la liberación y que fue asesinado por los militares en 1976, después del entierro de otros dos sacerdotes mártires, uno de los cuales, el padre Carlos Murias, franciscano conventual, había sido mi discípulo en las facultades de San Miguel. De ahí que el recuerdo de esos mártires riojanos pueda servir también 
para conmemorar el de los de la UCA de El Salvador, entre los cuales estuvieron dos compañeros míos de estudios teológicos en Innsbruck, a saber, Ignacio Yacuría y Segundo Montes. En primer lugar, describiré el rito del Tincunaco. Luego, en un segundo paso, interpretaré su significado sapiencial simbólico y su valor en tercer lugar, plantearé una digresión acerca del mestizaje cultural, fruto nuevo del encuentro con presentado por el Finalmente, alertaré sobre el, río, el peligro de que el rito quede en mero rito y mero símbolo, sin efectividad histórica y morriente política, a la vez que señalaré el dinamismo intrínseco que en él se da para que lo llevemos a la práctica efectiva, lo que impulsó a Monseñor Angelelli y a tantos otros hasta el testimonio no solo de la palabra, sino también de la sangre derramada. Primero, el Tincunaco, encuentro simbólico de dos pueblos y culturas. Cada año, el 31 de diciembre al mediodía, el pueblo de La Rioja, provincia del noroeste argentino, celebra la fiesta popular del Tincunaco, palabra quechua que significa encuentro. Pues se trata de la celebración simbólica y ritual del encuentro conflictivo y reconciliación entre dos pueblos, dos razas, dos culturas, a saber la española y la aborigen que hoy forman un solo pueblo mestizo que es fruto común de ambos. Con el documento de la segunda conferencia del Episcopado Latinoamericano en Puebla, se puede hablar de un fecundo mestizaje cultural y racial, producto no solo de la dialéctica de la conquista, amo-esclava, sino también de la dialógica del encuentro varón-mujer. El símbolo de dicho encuentro es el de dos imágenes, o mejor dicho, dos procesiones que las llevan, es decir, las del San Nicolás, patrono de La Rioja, y del niño Jesús Alcalde, que es el gobernador de La Rioja. Ambas confluyen desde direcciones contrarias frente a la Casa de Gobierno Provincial, antiguamente ante el Cabildo Municipal, precisamente el día de fin de año, destinado, según la tradición, a la toma de mando por los nuevos alcaldes de los, en los tiempos coloniales. La procesión que lleva la estatua de San Nicolás está presidida por el que se denomina alférez. El alférez, en tiempo de la colonia española, era quien portaba el estandarte real. Los cofrades que la, lo acompañan, quienes han llegado a caballo, llevan cruzado al pecho una banda roja, color, una banda morada, color episcopal de San Nicolás, y en sus manos un asta que parece llevar envuelta una bandera de colores. Por todos esos símbolos representan, junto con el alférez, a los españoles. La otra procesión que lleva el niño Jesús vestido de alcalde, sin olvidar el típico sombrero de plumas, el reloj de bolsillo ni el bastón de mando, está precedida por el así llamado Inca y simboliza al pueblo indio. Por eso los cofrades que acompañan al Inca llevan vinchas blancas en sus frentes y una especie de escapulario de espejitos sobre el pecho y la espalda. Un arco ad adornado con cintas colgantes de varios colores, es agitado sobre la cabeza del Inca, como danzando al compás de un bombo, mientras se canta la canción del Tincunaco en honor del santo niño y de su madre en lengua quechua, la lengua común del imperio incaico, que actualmente ninguno de ellos habla ni comprende. En el momento mismo del encuentro, 
bajo el abrasador sol del mediodía estival, riojano, eh, se reina un absoluto silencio. Entonces, todos los asistentes hincan su rodilla por tres veces ante el niño, reconociéndolo así como alcalde de la ciudad, la provincia y el mundo. También San Nicolás, llevado por los que simbolizan a los españoles, mediante la genuflexión de quienes lo portan en andas, adora al niño sostenido por quienes representan a los indios. Una antigua leyenda da razón del rito. Según se cuenta, en tiempo de la colonia hubo una rebelión indígena debido a la injusticia cometida por el alcalde español contra los indios. Estos amenazaban con destruir La Rioja. De ahí que mientras los españoles se entregaban a la oración y a la penitencia para impetrar de Dios la salvación de la ciudad, San Francisco Solano, misionero franciscano, se dirigió desarmado, quizás tocando música con su célebre violín, a donde estaban los insurrectos para pacificarlos. Estos, como respuesta a su predicación, aceptaron por millares el bautismo. La condición de la reconciliación fue la deposición del alcalde injusto. Desde entonces, todos los riojanos descendientes de españoles y o de indígenas reconocen como alcalde de la ciudad al niño Jesús, a fin de que en La Rioja reine la justicia. Todavía hoy el gobernador de la provincia, es decir, la máxima autoridad riojana actual, acepta en ese momento la autoridad soberana del niño alcalde y le entrega las llaves de la ciudad, pues con ese acto reconoce que gobierna en su nombre y debe hacerlo según su espíritu de paz y justicia, sobre todo hacia los más débiles. Segundo, una teología política en símbolos. El rito y la leyenda representan simbólicamente el origen del pueblo riojano y le hacen tomar conciencia nuevamente de su carácter de fruto del encuentro conflictivo de dos pueblos, razas y culturas, en la novedad originaria de un fecundo mestizaje. Estos símbolos cuestionan a sí mismos con su fuerza plástica la injusticia y la falta de equidad, pero no agudizan los conflictos, sino que con su potencial simbólico promueven la reconciliación basada en la justicia, el derecho y el encuentro. Tanto rito como leyenda exigen también tácitamente con sus símbolos una paz social justa en la cual se dé preferencia a los más pobres y oprimidos, quienes se congregan junto al niño alcalde. Además, el tincunaco confiesa simbólicamente que toda autoridad política viene de Dios y debe ser ejercida para el bien común, con especial cuidado de quienes son víctimas de la injusticia. Cristo es Señor y Alcalde, Cristo Rey, pero ese Señor es un niño, el cual ama preferentemente a los pequeños que lo tienen como patrono y símbolo. Es el pacificador que realiza la reconciliación entre aquellos que arrepentidos reconocen su autoridad justa y mansa. De ahí que el tincunaco pueda ser considerado como una teología política estructurada en símbolos, rito y leyenda, la cual se celebra cada año a fin de traerla a la memoria, representarla ritualmente y de ese modo proclamarla implicando al mismo tiempo un testimonio de una evento ya pasado y fundante, una interpretación política a realizar lo que significa una denuncia profética de lo que se le opone en la sociedad actual y un anuncio de potencialidades políticas que desafían nuestra libertad a hacerlas efectivas. Si como lo dice Paul Ricoeur, los símbolos 
no solo comunican sentido, sino también verdad, en cuanto ellos descubren y exponen, exponen la realidad más profunda y las posibilidades reales más propias, entonces el tinkunaco es la expresión ritual de la índole histórica más honda del pueblo riojano y quizás por extensión del pueblo latinoamericano. Como ella es percibi percibida por la sabiduría religiosa popular y a la vez es símbolo viviente tanto de su profundo anhelo de justicia y de paz como también de las posibilidades reales que en sí encierra de realizar efectivamente ya en la historia el encuentro con Dios y entre los hombres. Aún más, es una protesta plásticamente representada contra cualquier eventual injusticia o ruptura de la reconciliación. El rito repetido cada año es cada vez un llamado nuevo a realizar en la praxis histórica dichas posibilidades reales, respondiendo así al origen y a la identidad histórica más íntima de un pueblo que es fruto de un encuentro y mestizaje, a pesar de los conflictos que lo acompañaron y acompañan. Pues, como quedó dicho más arriba, la dialéctica varón-mujer, sin quitarle crueldad a la dialéctica amo-esclava, sin embargo, de suyo exige y lleva a la superación de esta en su fruto original y nuevo, el mestizaje cultural y no pocas veces también racial. Tercero, el mestizaje cultural y la reivindicación de la madre oprimida. Según el pensador uruguayo Alberto Metor Ferré, dos de las dialécticas que según San Pablo fueron reconciliadas en y por Cristo y fueron teorizadas por Gastón Fesar, a saber, varón, mujer y amo esclavo, se entrelazaron y fecundaron en los orígenes de América Latina, donde primó el mestizaje racial y cultural varón-mujer sobre el exterminio, como se dio en otras regiones, aunque dicho mestizaje fuera asignado por la dominación y la opresión amo-varón, mujer-esclava. Más tarde, la interpretación del mestizaje latinoamericano predominó a veces la ideología del blanqueo, blanqueo entre comillas. Blanqueo cultural como en la novela del venezolano Rómulo Gallegos, Doña Bárbara. Personaje mestizo que, como su nombre lo indica, representa poéticamente a la barbarie, según el sentido que le da el autor argentino Domingo Faustino Sarmiento en el subtítulo de su obra Facundo, cuando habla de civilización y barbarie entendida esta última como opuesta a la civilización occidental. En contraposición a Doña Bárbara, su hija debe occidentalizarse y blanquearse para poder casarse con Santos Luzardo, nombre y apellido que evocan respectivamente la santidad cristiana, Santos, y la luz de la ilustración, Luzardo. Por el contrario, en los últimos tiempos se rescata, en cambio, a diferencia de Doña Bárbara de Gallegos, la cultura de la madre, en especial indígena, como en la figura del indio Rendón Wilca, culturalmente mestizado, en la novela de José María Arguedas, Todas las sables, quien de alguna manera reúne en sí una síntesis equilibrada de todas las sangres y culturas del Perú. No por casualidad, en la novela de José... No, no por casualidad, Arguedas es tan apreciado por su compatriota, padre de la teología de la liberación, Gustavo Gutiérrez. Lo que se Rendón Wilta y otros personajes de distintas novelas de Arguedas simbolizan poéticamente Hoy se está dando socioculturalmente en la cultura popular suburbana de las grandes ciudades de América Latina. 
pues allí acontece un nuevo mestizaje de imaginarios culturales que parece preanunciar el camino hacia una genuina interculturalidad liberadora. Se trata de una nueva síntesis vital semejante a las descritas en la Conferencia de Puebla. Ya no solo entre las culturas de las diferentes etnias, sino también entre los valores y símbolos de las culturas tradicionales y los de las culturas moderna y posmoderna. Así es como surge hoy un verdadero reto a la política y a la pastoral de la cultura y las culturas en América Latina, que también desafía a la teología de liberación latinoamericana. San Pablo, además de ambas dialécticas humanas, varón-mujer y amo-esclavo, tiene, tiene también en cuenta otra teológica, judío-pagán, que asimismo fue reflexionada por Fesar. Si aplicamos las tres a la primera evangelización iberoamericana, encontramos que la mujer india oprimida, madre del primer mestizaje racial y cultural, se convirtió de hecho de pagana en cristiana, madre de hijos cristianos. Y además que de parte del amo ibérico, varón, se dio la ambigüedad contradictoria que muchos pastores fustigaron desde Bartolomé de las Casas en adelante, a saber que mediante la evangelización y el bautismo se reconocía la dignidad de los paganos convertidos e implícitamente la de sus culturas. Y, por otro lado, no se las reconocía fácticamente en su valor de humanidad como si esos pueblos no fueran cultural y políticamente adultos. Ya antes de la conquista y del descubrimiento de América. Y de ese modo se justificaba ideológicamente la conquista y la encomienda. La simbología del Tincunaco no solo revaloriza el mestizaje cultural renovado hoy por el nuevo mestizaje de imaginarios culturales tradicional, moderno y posmoderno, en la sabiduría de en los suburbios, la sabiduría de los habitantes de los suburbios de las grandes ciudades de Iberoamérica, sino que, sin olvidar la herencia del padre, reivindica preferentemente también la de la madre. Pues no solo se recoge la sabiduría existencial, humana y religiosa del buen vivir de los pueblos originarios, sobre todo evangelizados, sino que se la mestiza con los aportes de la ciencia y tecnología occidentales en una nueva síntesis vital para lograr una sociedad más humana, equitativa y justa. La propuesta de Pedro Trigo, el teólogo de la liberación venezolano, acerca de, cito, una América Latina pluricultural para contribuir proactivamente a una globalización alternativa, hasta ahí la cita de Trigo, ya está siendo de hecho practicada en los pocos casos tipo emergentes en las culturas suburbanas, por ejemplo, del Gran Buenos Aires, aunque yo prefiero hablar de interculturalidad más que de pluriculturalidad. Pienso, entre otros, en el, ejemplo, el caso ejemplar de unos cartoneros, recogedores de basura, suburbanos bonaerenses, quienes, gracias a la mediación de agentes pastorales, aprendieron de científicos y técnicos de la Universidad Tecnológica Nacional en su sede de Quilmes, un barrio de Gran Buenos Aires, aprendieron cómo reciclar los plásticos, liberándose así de los intermediarios que los explotaban. Acogieron los aportes de la ciencia moderna, combinándolos, yo diría mestizándolos, con su sabiduría popular, emprendedora, creativa y solidaria. Cuarto y último, ambigüedad y fuerza de los símbolos. Claro está que los símbolos, como los del Tincunaco, debido a su plurisignificatividad,
pueden también ser manipulados ideológicamente a fin de enmascarar la opresión, limitando la justicia, la conversión y la reconciliación solo al plano simbólico y cúltico, sin incidencia ética, política y social efectiva. Pero de esa manera se estaría frenando la dinámica interna que les es propia y traicionando la verdad metafórica que ellos exponen y anuncian. Por el contrario, una auténtica teología de liberación y de la evangelización de la cultura en América Latina puede iluminar con la palabra de Dios la sabiduría popular, humana y cristiana plasmada en dichos símbolos, para así interpretarlos teológicamente y ponerlos efectivamente en práctica. Así como también esos símbolos y su interpretación humana pueden servir de instrumento para una comprensión inculturada de la misma palabra de Dios y de su anuncio de reconciliación, paz y justicia en Cristo. Pautas importantes para una interpretación teológica y pastoral del Tincunaco en clave de liberación y a la luz del Evangelio, las podemos encontrar, como ya quedó insinuado más arriba, en las cartas pastorales, predicaciones y acciones de uno de los más destacados pastores riojanos, el ya mencionado Monseñor Enrique Angelelli, quien fue martirizado por su defensa de la justicia y los derechos humanos. La iniciación del proceso de su beatificación lo confirma como modelo para todos. Por consiguiente, el tincunaco parece ser un fruto ritual de la evangelización de la cultura, plasmada en símbolos de la piedad popular. La sabiduría humana y cristiana que ellos expresan puede servir de mediación para una teología inculturada que tome en serio los símbolos religiosos del pueblo y los ilumine, disierna e interprete a la luz de la Palabra de Dios. Y en especial para una teología política que denuncie proféticamente la inequidad social que hoy vive América Latina e interpele políticamente a nuestra libertad para hacer realidad una sociedad más humana y más justa. Muchas gracias. Hello everybody. It's nice to be here. Uh, I want to start by thanking Peter uh, for inviting me and uh, for along with Francis and Karen uh, putting on such a marvelous conference. Uh, sort of a disadvantage of coming at the end is that um, all kinds of interesting lights were shed on the theme that uh, I wanted to go back and rewrite my paper <coughs> um, to talk about, for instance, Antonio Vieira, who I did not know about before. And uh, since uh, Andrew Prevo spoke so compellingly about the relationship between <coughs> mysticism and testimony, I felt like I had to go back and take that into account. But don't worry, I didn't rewrite it because it would have been longer. Um, but um, what I want to talk about Uh, this afternoon is um, builds on the link between memory and testimony, which I think is uh, clear enough. By inserting the third term in the middle, uh, mysticism, I would like to explore and propose a, a mystical transformation or a mysticism that I think is evident in the martyrs whose memory we celebrate today. Uh, in so doing, I assume without arguing, first of all, the insistence in recent scholarship on Christian spirituality that mysticism is not to be identified by supernatural visions or extraordinary experiences of the annihilation of the ego or something like that, but rather that it marks a transformation of the whole person. And for Christian mysticism in particular, a transformation that makes her or him more able to love. Secondly, um, I'm taking a hint from a tradition going back at least to Augustine but continued in the Middle Ages that defined the soul, or human subjectivity, if you will, in terms of the interwoven powers of intellect, reason, will, and memory. There was a lively debate in the high and late Middle Ages over whether mystical union with God was located primarily in reason or in the will, with Dominicans more or less aligning themselves with the former and the Franciscans the latter. 
Uh, no one to my knowledge ever explored the possibility that memory, that third very important uh, power of the soul might be a locus of mystical union, even though, as scholars like Mary Carruthers have shown, uh, memory was held in high esteem in the Middle Ages. So following this hint, I would describe what I would, uh, doing this afternoon is something of a thought experiment. Um, that is, are there gains to be had from thinking about mystical union as something like a union of memories, a transformation of memory such that then contributes to the witness of love that is given, so testimony, so memory, mysticism, testimony. And might such an experiment help us appreciate and learn from the martyrs whose memory we celebrate today? So I'll proceed in three stages. Uh, first of all, it is essential to see in memory more than the cybernetic recall of facts from the past in order to make it a genuinely theological category. For this I draw on Johann Baptiste Metz, who drew in turn on the work of Walter Benjamin, Secondly, if we are to think of a union of memories, we must also think, with all necessary analogical caveats, about God's memory. Metz doesn't do that, but Gustavo Gutierrez does, so I'll draw on him. In bringing their conceptions of memory into conversation, I will then try to draw out a few implications for the theme of our conference by proposing what I will call an anamnestic mysticism. So first I'll talk about Metz. Catholic theologian Johann Baptist Metz adopted memory as a key anthropological and theological category in the late 60s. Um, actually, so this is one little footnote. He actually did it because he was accused of being too close to Schmidt. And it was only after he did that that he started talking about what he was doing as the new political theology in distinction. Um, in any event, um, he actually got it a little bit from um, Herbert Marcuse, but the person who was most important was Walter Benjamin. That eccentric satellite of the Frankfurt School. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to start with Benjamin. In one of his theses on the philosophy of history, Benjamin wrote the following, quote, we know that the Jews were prohibited from investigating the future. The Torah and prayers instruct them in remembering, however. But this does not imply that the past, that for the Jews, the future turned into a homogenous empty time. For every second of time was the straight gate through which the Messiah might enter. With this and other theses, Benjamin opposed a way of remembering the past and writing history that presumed time to be a homogeneous, empty continuum filled up indifferently with this or that chain of events. On this view, which Benjamin identified with historicism, the task of the historian is simply to depict that chain of events the way it really happened. The historian is to trace different chains of cause and effect emphasizing the links in the chain that lead to our own present. The past has no other claim on the present, no presence, not even the presence of absence, the mournful absence of a past era's future, chains in which the links were shattered by natural or historical catastrophe. To be precise, the only past that historicism allows to be present is the one that survived. It is the victor's past that dominates such a history. The hopes and dreams of those who were vanquished are forgotten, they have no further claim or influence on our present. Benjamin insisted in contrast that the historian's task is, quote, to brush history against the grain, close quote, by letting those forgotten hopes from the past reemerge in the present. Remembering the past and recounting its history must mean, quote, fanning into flames those sparks of hope that are found in the past, close quote. Benjamin did not shy away from theological language to describe this. He says this is to redeem the past. For the person who brushes history against the grain, quote, the past has a secret index by which it is referred to redemption, close quote. The historian, quote, grasps the constellation in which his own era comes into contact with a specific earlier one, establishes a conception of the present time as the time of the now, German Jetzeit, which is shot through with shards of messianic time, close quote. It is the capacity to do this, <coughs> a uniquely human capacity, according to Benjamin, to allow a repressed or vanished hope from the past to flare up anew, to inspire the present, that he names a weak messianic power. Metz agreed in formulating his category of dangerous memory, first in the late 60s. We remember the suffering of past generations, but also, as sometimes he does not sufficiently recognize, their joys, their hopes, their aspirations their dreams, the ways they exercised agency, 
even though many of these were cut short, left unfulfilled by unjustly inflicted suffering and death. Taking this stance toward the past means taking a stance toward the future such that these hopes have a share in the future that we envision from our hopes. It is, this is the only stance for Metz that opens up a humane future. A stance, though, that Metz worries is being increasingly repressed in Europe, and he thinks particularly of European forgetfulness of the Shoah, and too often with tacit complicity of the church. And for Metz, the degree to which the church is so complicit marks also the degree to which it represses and denies its constitutive roots in Judaism. In the 1980s, and even more so after the reunification of Germany, Nietzsche became the primary interlocutor of Metz's unveiling of this danger, what he calls individual and cultural amnesia. Quote, Nietzsche is the one who came up with the motto, blessed are the forgetful, intentionally echoing the biblical beatitude, blessed are they who mourn, close quote. Modern scientific technological society is, on Metz's reading, making this motto its own, quote, under the quasi-mythical totality of a technical rationality, what threatens us is an intelligence without pathos, an intelligence that has no need for any insistent and obstinate speech because it functions smoothly without any contradictions or conflicts, an intelligence that knows nothing of memory precisely because it is not threatened by forgetting. The person is computerized intelligence without any sensitivity to suffering, without any morality, in short, a rhapsody of innocence congealed into a smoothly functioning machine. It is against this backdrop that Metz argues that Judaism and Christianity, at least if Christianity doesn't forget its connection back to Judaism, indispensable gift to modernity is an understanding of reason for which memory, in the sense that Benjamin outlined it, is constitutive. In contrast to the scientific reason, advocated by the Enlightenment, or even to Jürgen Habermas's proposal of a communicative reason, Metz asserts the need for an anamnestic reason. Now one way we could think about what he means by that is to take up his intriguing assertion in the long quote I just read, that scientific reason, or computerized intelligence, knows nothing of memory precisely because it is not threatened by forgetting. Despite its increasingly comprehensive and unassailable mastery of data from the fat past, the computerized intelligence does not remember. And neither does human reason that takes its measure by this cybernetic power of recall. This is, I suggest, simply another way of stating Benjamin's critique of historicism. So I will return again to Benjamin. Once again, employing theological language, Benjamin wrote the following. Quote, of course, only a redeemed humanity can fully inherit its past, which is to say only for a redeemed humanity can its past become citable in all its moments. Only for, from the perspective of a total redemption do all the possible futures of all past moments find their fulfillment. In the face of such a daunting, indeed impossible task for Benjamin, we have, he insists, only a weak messianic power. We can draw only a few of those shattered or repressed moments of the past into the light of the present and allow them to live again, however fleetingly, in our own hopes and aspirations. There can be only shards of messianic time. Thus, all our remembering is surrounded by a penumbra of forgetting. Our remembering and consequently our knowing is threatened by forgetting. To recognize this, which is not to overcome it, is to allow an element of mourning to find its way into all our remembering and knowing. Yet this is the price of envisioning and hoping in a future that is more than just a continuation of the victors and their hopes. Now the Metzian gloss on this statement, I think, would go something like this. A computerized intelligence fills the empty homogenous continuum of time with chains of events without reference to that in them that is unfulfilled and unredeemed. That is, in the, t in the sense of Benjamin, it doesn't really remember. While the lack of certain data from the past might render some of these chains a little less secure than others, this kind of intelligence is not really threatened by forgetting, as is human memory and the anamnestic reason connected with it. But neither can it hope for any future other than an extrapolation or evolution, that's his bête noire, of, into the present, and of the present into the future. 
remembering in which the past, including the past that cannot be fully recalled because its traces were wiped out, becomes genuinely, oftenly disturbingly present, is impossible to the computerized intelligence. Human beings can and do forget in this sense, but by the same token, they genuinely remember. This constitutes the threat to memory and its proper dignity. Like all forms of human subjectivity, human memory is finite. Like human knowing in general, it is selective. Some past moments, but not others, are present in a particular way modulated by particular hopes that informed those past moments, while others recede into the penumbral background of forgetting. Some are simply lost without possible recall because all their traces have been annihilated. How can these forgotten elements of the past still be authentically present to us, shaping our understanding of the present and our hopes and planning for the future, even in their absence from our ability to recall them? Metz responds that this is only possible by virtue of a particular sense for the past, a mystical virtue, he names it. Uh, the German is a Vermissenswissen, something like a sense for what is missing, a sense for what is absence, a sense for what didn't make it. It is for him a mystical disposition by which the past, what has been forgotten from the past, is not completely lost, but it resides in this penumbra of forgetting surrounding what we remember at any given moment, is always then ready to be redeemed, flaring up like an ember in the present. It is our dignity and charge as free human beings to be open to the claim that these memories, dangerous memories, might make on us, and to resist a historicism that would relegate them to the utter darkness of permanent forgetfulness. This is all the more the case when it is not just the ineluctable finitude of the human condition that links forgetting and remembering, but human sinfulness and pride, or the repression of the guilt that accompanies an insight um, Walter Benjamin's famous line that every monument to culture is also a monument to barbarism. The insight that our history is marked by sin and that the blood of those who were killed along the way cries out from the historical ground on which we now stand. Metz names this complex way that human beings relate to the past and through that to the present and future, the dialectic of remembering and forgetting. Thus far with Benjamin, Yet for Metz, unlike Benjamin, our own reliance on a weak messianic power can only be conceived as being carried by the strong messianic power of the God of Jesus. Quote, the God of the living and the dead, Metz writes, the God who touches even past suffering, who does not leave even the dead in their repose, who reaches those memories and those hopes that reside in that penumbra of forgetting and can bring them back and can cause them uh, flare up in the present. So we can only bear the sinful guilt of our anamnestic reason as we turn in prayer, so here I echo a theme that Andrew uh, introduced to us yesterday, to the saving God for whom full redemption is possible indeed has been brought to pass. And this turning too is rooted in memory because it is rooted in the memory of the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Christian hope draws on the remembrance of that past life um, of Jesus' suffering and death, but also the memory of his resurrection as the redemption of that life and the pledge of fulfillment for the hope that oriented it, that is, the full coming of God's kingdom and the redemption of all history that it symbolizes. But while Metz introduces thus God as a sort of salvific frame for this uh, dialectic of remembering and forgetting, he does not investigate further whether the human dialectic of remembering and forgetting has its image in God. So for this, I turn to uh, Gustavo Gutierrez and his reflections on a Dios memorioso. Gustavo Gutierrez frequently uses the saying of the great Dominican advocate for the Indians, Bartolomé de las Casas, to enter into a discussion of God's memory. Del más chiquito y del más olvidado, Dios tiene la memoria muy viva y muy reciente. I'll try. Of the littlest and most forgotten ones, God has a very fresh and living memory. Gutierrez insists that, quote, the God of the Bible is a God richly endowed with memory, a God who does not forget the covenant that God establishes with God's people. So I think he provides a perfect counterpoint to Metz. Like Metz, Gutierrez distinguishes memory from a cy cybernetic compilation of past events. Quote, memory is not history if by the latter we understand a simple relating of past events. 
Memory is the present of the past that has its source in the ever-present and indefectible love of God. This is a crucial insight which makes of history a theophany, a revelation of God that calls to life and rejects every form of unjust death." Close quote. Remembering makes of God's saving acts in history an urgent challenge now to act in accord with them. As Gutierrez notes, uh, citing from Deuteronomy 5.3, quote, not with our ancestors did the Lord make this covenant, but with us, who are all of us here, alive, today. And the Gospel of Luke. Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Chapter 4, verse 21. We can, in addition, however, I think, speak of memory, not only in the context of the people's memory, but as a crucial mediation on God's side of the relationship between God and God's people. God remembers the covenant with the people to the thousandth generation. Indeed, because of this memory, God can be called on to forget the people's sins as an expression of the freely given love that is the foundation of the covenant and the indestructible fidelity by means of which God's love stretches itself out through time. Multiple psalms could be cited here, right? Psalm 25, 79, 106. Gutierrez hints in this way at a dialectic of remembering and forgetting proper to God's presence in and to history. And so what I'd like to do now is to see if we can bring the two of them together. If, as Metz suggests, it is true that forgetting is an element of remembering, and not just as a threat to memory, but as integral to its dignity. And if we can, with necessary caveats about analogical predication, think about God's memory, then I suggest a, the following way of thinking about Gutierrez's point. If there be a selectivity to God's, um, God's memory a forgetting, it is a selectivity governed by God's free and sovereign love. God's love for the people God has chosen as God's own, and in particular for the least ones. The ones who, to whom society concedes no future, that is, forgets, these are the ones um, for whom God has a fresh and living memory. When I was uh, writing this originally, I came across a homily, there's a footnote, I couldn't resist, by Pope Benedict um, on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of Pope Lauren Progressio. Um, and it's a homily on uh, Lazarus um, and the rich man. And the title of the homily is, um, oh, it's, uh, to those whom everyone in society forgets, God does not forget. Sorry, I had it in German and I couldn't do that. And that is, er, those whom society forgets, God does not forget. It's the title of Benedict's homily. So the ones to whom society concedes no future are the ones for whom God has a fresh and living memory. In God's preferential remembering, governed by the love that is given shape in the covenant, God forgets the sins of God's people. That is, these sins and the way of life to which they give shape are accorded no future. They recede into the fringes of forgetfulness. From this perspective, the preferentiality of God's love manifests itself in the way that God remembers and forgets, turning God's back on sin and its concretizations in history so that they have no future, remembering those whom everyone else has forgotten so that they do have a history, a future. This remembering on God's part makes a claim on how the people of God remember. So now to close the circle. In the Hebrew Bible, the people are called to make God's memory their own, according to Gutierrez, which means making their own God's remembrance of those who are overlooked and marginalized, you know, the well-known trio of the widow, the orphan, the stranger. Gutierrez reminds us that, quote, the giving of the law and the norms of contact, uh, conduct begins with, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there. And similar phrases that he cites from Deuteronomy. The New Testament, he argues, also emphasizes this remembering. So Gutierrez concludes that, quote, the gratuitous love of God, the heart of biblical revelation, is the model for the believer's action. It is the most important thing we remember, acting like a north star that orients the community of Jesus' followers whose task it is to be precisely a sign of this love in history. Discerning this North Star by making God's memory one's own is tantamount for Gutierrez to reading the signs of the times. On the one hand, it allows us to perceive new possibilities. The strength and constancy of God's memory opens to us the novelty of God's will for the future. 
Every moment becomes indeed a straight gate through which the Messiah might enter. For Gutierrez, this is particularly important in a postmodern age that often creates, quote, a certain skepticism whose consequences run the gamut from passivity to despair when it comes to possibility for changing the status quo. We've already seen in Metz's thought the power of memory to break through the power of the status quo, which is defined only by the memories of those who've made it. Gutierrez notes that the community unleashes this power by giving flesh in its own vision and action to the memory of God, particularly the memory of the least ones and the forgotten. Quote, called to live out the impact of God's memory in our time, this allows us to see that new and promising clues for living together socially are woven into it, both for the life of faith and for finding pathways that open us in a vital and creative way to the gift of hope. Theology, to the extent that it is an interpretation of hope, hermeneutic of hope, has an important role to play in this, close quote. Finally, to the extent that we exceed, succeed in doing this, we incarnate a new God's memory in our own dialectic of remembering forgetting, which is to say we give testimony to it. Gutierrez expresses this complex interweaving of God's memory, the memory of the people and their action in history, and the role of theology in uh, one of several summary statements he gives of the significance of Bartolomé de las Casas. Quote, Las Casas always had the sense that the situation of the Indies represented something tremendously novel. Coming to terms with it required categories that were equally novel. One of them, and the most important one for him, is that of reading and rereading the events as if we were Indians, from the perspective of the poor in whom Christ is present. This is not only a question of theological methodology, Gutierrez continues, but has to do with the journey toward the God of life. It was his way of making his own the fresh and living memory that God has for the smallest and most forgotten. Testimonies like those of Monsignor Angelelli, we just heard about, Monsignor Romero, and so many others in Latin America make this memory present among us. Las Casas' theological genius, according to Gutierrez, consisted in his ability to find tools to elaborate theologically this key spiritual insight. Quote, seeing in the Indian, in this other of the Western world, the poor that the gospel tells us about. This evangelical and mystical intuition, Gutierrez continues, is the root of his spirituality, close quote. I suggest we think of this as a mystical union of God's memory and human memory. That is a mysticism that is focused in the human capacity of memory, transforming human memory and thus our way of being in history and being toward the future. That this gave Las Casas a powerful presence in orienting wisdom in the turbulent world of old and new Spain. For Gutierrez, Las Casas becomes a witness to the memory of God, and to the extent that his testimony was successful, that memory becomes available in a new and inspiriting way for the church as a whole. So conclusion. Mysticism is a union of memories and theology is a hermeneutic of hope. It may well be that the urgency of remembering correctly in this age of atrocities is a part of the uh, impetus behind the current interest in the topic of memory. Indeed, some like Miroslav Wolf have argued that some memories need to be forgotten, an assertion that can be both affirmed and denied on the basis of what I just laid out. Much more can and must can and must be done to exp um, explore a theology that is a memoria querens intellectum. Given the limits of time, I'll make two concluding remarks to flesh out my suggestion that a praxis of memory testimony evident in the Latin American martyrs can be understood in terms of a mystical union in which the locus of union with God is not found so much in the intellect or the will, the two options explored in the Middle Ages as in memory. First, I've suggested that we speak of a union of memories, which our memory, defined by the dialectic of remembering and forgetting, is united with and conformed to God's memory, who remembers even and especially those by, uh, consigned by a sinful history to an oblivion that resists even the most resolute attempts to remember them by human means. Is this not the condition for the possibility of the redemption of which Walter Benjamin spoke 
without perhaps really believing it possible. Such a mysticism would have a dark night of its own, since it would not bring so much the capacity to remember all past events and recall that those medievals who saw the mystical union of the beatific vision located in human reason, that that mysticism didn't suddenly make us all omniscient. Right? So too, there is a dark night of the mysticism of, his, of memories. This kind of mysticism requires and nourishes an intensification of that sense of what is absent, what Metz names the Vermissenswissen. It stands at the border of remembering and forgetting, and in which we not only mourn more deeply, but precisely as a consequence, can genuinely celebrate and hope more radically. And finally, act more faithfully in history walking humbly before God in history, if I can steal a line from this evening's speaker. Secondly, located in the human capacity that ties us ineluctably to history, that is memory, and I think of Paul Ricoeur's massive book on memory, history, and forgetting. Um, such a mysticism, I think, would belong to that genus in the history of Christian spirituality known as contemplation and action. So now I'll go out on a limb and say something that I really can't back up at the point, but I think it could be argued that the emergence of this category of contemplation and action at, toward the end of the Middle Ages can actually be looked upon as a tacit exploration of precisely the kind of mysticism of union of memories that is uh, the road less taken by the great medieval mystics. To take the spirituality represented by um, those martyrs whose memory we celebrate today, I'll suggest that an underappreciated aspect of Ignatian spirituality and the spiritual exercises in particular is the way that it depends on and opens the way to a transformation of memory. In the exercises of the so-called uh, second week of Jesus's, um, of the exercises, we remember in a vivid and self-involving way the events of Jesus's life, his work, his suffering, death, and resurrection. And it's only in the context of this kind of remembering that a proper election can be made for Ignatius. That is a choice of how one's own life can praise, reverence, and serve God. In the concluding exercise to the spiritual exercises, the contemplation to attain love, it's all about memory. We're supposed to call to mind all that God has done for us. And we do so after, well, if you did the full 30 days, an intensive work of memory of connecting the memory of what God has done with us with the memory of Jesus. The one making the retreat is urged to remember the good that God has done. And in the culminating prayer of the exercise, the so-called Susipe, he or she offers to God all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, my entire will, and all I have and possess. If we might see the offer of freedom as marking the desire for an un unconditional openness to the will of God, spoken of typically in terms of the Ignatian virtue of indifference, I suggest the offer of memory is the opening of oneself to a transformation of one's memory that will give concrete substance to the commitment of one's life that one will make. And it provides its orienting North Star, which is to unite our memory with God's fresh and living memory of the littlest and most forgotten. Thank you. I'd like to thank Dr. Peter Casarella, everyone at the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology, and the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro Center for Theology and Human Sciences for their generous invitation to this conference and its wonderful theme. Their cooperation is itself a witness that North-South interaction can be cooperative and lead to solidarity and not exploitation. To that end, I'd like to reflect on the testimonio of Archbishop Oscar Romero, and particularly how to receive that testimony here in the United States. As it was intoned in Michael Vuddy's presentation yesterday on reception, 
The question is, do we have eyes to see and ears to hear? There is a twofold danger. There is the danger that we don't want to hear from Eros' testimony. Look at the 2010 decision by the Texas School Board to remove mention of Romero from high school textbooks, a decision that John Stewart described as how Oscar Romero got disappeared by right-wingers for the second time. However, more insidious perhaps is the danger that though we are willing to receive his testimony, we are unable to, either through a, either through a distanciation that by focusing on the spectacular removes ways that Romero can challenge us, or if you will, a proximization that by domesticating Romero waters down that challenge to vague moral epithets. More than geographic distance, more than chronological distance, more than hermeneutic distance, we are confronted with a distance of historical reality to hear uh, Romero's testimony and this involves, and crossing this involves a journey for which the church has only begun to develop a language. For all that has been written on social sin and the preferential option for the poor, we find ways to rationalize and co-opt. We may begrudgingly admit of social ills in our country, but as a church we struggle to name white privilege and sexism. We had a Catholic vice presidential candidate propose a draconian budget and call it the preferential option. Clearly, no amount of words, no amount of rational arguments suffice. What is needed is conversion. And if conversion is needed, then I would maintain that Romero himself uh, provides us a way to understand and <coughs> undergo that conversion. And today, I'd like to consider a, a fuller understanding of conversion revealed in Romero's testimony in three claims. Number one, that the transformation Romero experienced as he became archbishop should be called a conversion, but one conceived not as a response to a singular dramatic event, but an evolution prompted by confronting the reality of poverty. Number two, that at the heart of Romero's conversion is a new way of seeing and that seeing is the realization of social sin and its historical demands. Three, finally, that Romero's conversion culminates in and embodies a preferential option for the poor, a response that simultaneously may be described as a coming home and the interruption of the unhomely. Obviously, to speak of a person's conversion cannot mean fully capturing that complex dynamic that is ultimately the human encounter with the mystery of God. Only hubris could claim to possess the story of Romero's conversion. To speak of Romero's conversion in the United States is not to speak from a position of power that gets to dictate the terms and manipulate the results. It is to speak from a place of need, a place of lack, a place that fears that we, after we stand before Jesus and have justified ourselves, we might turn away unable to respond to the invitation. There is one more thing you need. Give all that you have to the poor and come follow me. With this in mind, let me turn to that remarkable transformation of Oscar Romero and how it can help us think about conversion anew. Many who know little else about Romero know this basic narrative. Oscar Romero is named Archbishop of San Salvador in February of 1977. While powerful elements of the Salvadoran church and society view this appointment with satisfaction, other priests, catechists, and base communities are bitterly disappointed. However, something momentous occurs to Romero that transform him from the timid, conservative cleric he had been into a bold prophet and champion of the poor. On March 12, 1977, just three weeks after Romero's installation as archbishop, the Jesuit priest Rutilio Grande is assassinated along with 72-year-old Manuel Solorzado and 16-year-old Nelson Rutilio Lemus. Romero, confronted by the brutality of his close friend's murder, undergoes an inconceivable change that sets the course of his ministry as archbishop in a completely different direction. 
as Robert McDermott po uh, puts it, for the new archbishop, the murder of Rutilio Grande was a moment of truth. As he prayed over his dead friend, he faced with conversion a New Testament's uh, New Testament style metanoia. He knew that he would have to choose sides. End quote. Now, as a narrative, this account of Romero's conversion is compelling. It possesses a dramatic arc and articulates some important reasons why there is and should be a deep respect for this remarkable figure. I might also note that in the U.S. it indicates how much of an influence the Paulist film Romero has. Most all my students know that movie. Yet it is the very drama of the story, the sudden nature of the narration that can distort the testimony and make of conversion not only something dramatic but implicitly remote from the experience of the average Christian. While the change that took place in Romero's life as he became Archbishop of San Salvador is often described as a conversion, the appropriateness and meaning of this description are not always clear. For example, consider William James's classic definition of conversion as occurring when, quote, religious ideas previously peripheral in a person's consciousness now take central place and religious aims form the habitual center of her or his energy, end quote. Romero's experience after becoming archbishop does not involve moving from unbelief to belief. Throughout the course of Romero's life, one in which he was born into a Catholic family and aspired to priesthood even as a boy, we see religious aims at the center of Romero's energy. Similarly, Romero's change cannot be classified as a sudden repentance from personal sin. From his childhood through his decades as a priest, Romero rec recognized all too well his own sinfulness and the need for forgiveness. Indeed, if anything, Romero's spirituality over his lifetime was marked more by an inclination to scrupulosity regarding his sinfulness than the need for a fundamental reorientation and conversion. This is not meant to deny a dramatic element to Romero's experience. With Walter Kahn, we can affirm that, born Christian, that a born Christian may experience, quote, a cognitive, affective, moral, and faith transformation which a new and vital relationship with the person of Christ effects. Quote. However, we need not of necessity see this transformation as divorced from the rest of a person's life. For Karl Rahner, conversion is experienced as, quote, the gift of God's grace and as radical fundamental decision which concerns a human life in its entirety even when it is realized in a particular concrete decision in a everyday life, end quote. Related intimately with that fundamental option, we can affirm Romero's change in relation to the whole of his life. Conversion is not a violent divine intervention, but the dynamic coincidence of God's grace and human response in freedom. This coincidence though it might be marked by certain moments of intensification, must be placed within a complex network of interactions that are biographical, psychological, historical, social, etc., and span across a lifetime. This is why most commentators on Romero prefer, as indeed Romero himself did, to speak of his transformation in terms of a process, an evolution, Though his evolution might be seen as culminating, or at least intensified, in the Grande assassination, it is one that stretches over a longer period of time. In June 1978, Romero addressed the question of his conversion in a visit to Cardinal Baggio, prefect of the Congregation of Bishops. Baggio expressed his displeasure with the idea that Romero had been converted, and that Romero might see himself as a prophet as opposed to his fellow bishops who had not been converted. Romero responded to these allegations vehemently. Quote, I denied having used the phrase attributed to me of having been converted, and much less uh, having compared myself to the other bishops or vainly believing myself a prophet. What happened in my priestly life, I have tried to explain to myself as an evolution of the same desire I have always had to be faithful to what God asks of me. Many of Romero's closest associates affirm 
that he rejected a dramatic notion of conversion in his self-understanding. Ricardo Urioste, Romero's vicar general, says, I believe that Monsignor Romero was someone who always, throughout his life, sought conversion, but qualifies this by adding, he never spoke of himself in terms of conversion, he spoke of evolution. Similarly, Bishop Gregorio Rosa Chavez relates that he asked Romero directly if he had been converted, to which Romero responded, I wouldn't say it's been a conversion, but an evolution. The importance of speaking about Romero's transformation as an evolution is that it does justice to the entirety of Romero's life, his childhood and familial influences, his 35 years of ordained ministry, and the personal faith that Romero possessed and nurtured prior to the dramatic events of 1977. It provides a more complex and integrative concept of change than an instantaneous transformation. More approximately, understanding Romero's conversion as an evolution places it and the Grande assassination in a wider context that acknowledges the importance of that period between 1974 and 1977 when Romero served as bishop in Santiago de Maria, the diocese that included his hometown of Ciudad Barrios. As Zacarias Diaz and Juan Macho relate, it was there that Romero confronted the misery and oppression of campesinos, the many small children dying of preventable diseases and malnutrition, and the repressive violence against those who would raise a voice in protest for justice. Traveling to small villages on horseback and opening the doors of the diocesan house during cold winter nights of the coffee harvest, Romero confronted a reality that he had forgotten, repressed, or at least allowed to fade to the periphery of his concerns. Whatever the case, when speaking of Romero's change, the period in Santiago de Maria must be counted as a crucial period in his evolution and offers a glimpse into the content of Romero's conversion. Thus, the language of evolution helpfully draws attention to the continuity of Romero's lifelong journey of faith and more richly accounts for the complex process through which the events of 1977 can be seen as a culmination. Any change in Romero at that time should be seen within the longer journey of Romero's faith and furthermore, as a moment in a transformation that continued forward over the course of Romero's time as archbishop. As Romero himself would attest, conversion is continual. Locking Romero's conversion into the months of February and March of 1977 ultimately presents an ahistorical view of conversion and ignores the process he would continue until his assassination in March of 1980. Moreover, in our context, the focus on the dramatic can displace Romero's challenge. If we can chalk Romero's conversion up to the spectacular, then we can keep it distant from our ordinary lives. On a pedestal, Romero cannot speak to us directly. We enact that worry that Dorothy Day voiced when asked about her own possible canonization. Don't call me a saint, she said. I don't want to be dismissed that easily. Though seeing Romero's conversion as an evolution avoids the distortion of distancing, its emphasis on continuity should not obscure the sense of real and radical change that took place in Romero's life. To be sure, there was a real change in Romero after he became archbishop that should not be overlooked nor glossed over. As Romero's successor, Bishop Arturo Rivera Idama states, I agree with those who speak of a conversion of Monsignor Romero in the moment in which he assumed the pastoral charge of the Archdiocese of San Salvador. Before the body of Father Rutilio Grande, Monsignor Romero on his 20th day as Archbishop felt the call of Christ to defeat his natural human timidity and to fill himself with the intrepidness of the Apostle. This intrepidness in Romero's preaching and actions marked a significant change in Romero's life and ministry, and it is in exploring that change that we can specify how Romero's conversion can challenge us. Had we more time, we could explore specific moments in which Romero evidences a change in temperament and action, among them his calling for Grande's funeral mass to be the only mass in the country, his personal boycott of General Humberto Romero's presidential inauguration, bold public defiance where he once worked only behind the scenes, 
his support of the Colegio El Sagrado Corazón in marked contrast to his actions in the so-called externado affair. The openness theologically to ideas and figures whom he once found suspicious. His seeking advice and collaboration where he was once aloof and private. These all speak to a real change in Romero, and if we are to call that change a conversion, they raise the question about the content of that conversion. From what did Romero turn? In some sense, Romero's conversio is a turning away from something. This is made clear in the resistance and criticism that he faced. In Maria Lopez Vigil's magnificent biography, translated as Memories in Mosaic, the reaction of wealthy San Salvadorans who had their gifts of a house and car rejected by Romero is recounted. Quote, they say that when the hoity-toity women of San Salvador realized how Monsignor Romero was changing, they got offended and said, that boy has turned out to have very bad manners. <laughs> Romero's own diary entry of August in 79 notes an encounter with a woman from one of the Salvadoran wealthy families who says Romero is, quote, not the same as before, and that I deceived them. He reflects, I understand that this calumny is common in those who do not want the church to touch their petty interests. Of course, this turning away from also meant a turning towards something else. For Car uh, Carmen Alvarez, it was that Romero had formerly lived away from reality, por los aguacates, I love that phrase, but now saw the reality of the poor. Other commentators also use the metaphor of sight, which can signal not just the radical shift from blindness, seeing nothing, to sight, but also a deepening of sight, a seeing more fully. Ricardo Urioste likens Romero's conversion to the healing of the blind man from Bethsaida in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 8. As Jesus heals him by putting spittle in his eyes, he only sees blurry figures. Only, by being, uh, only upon being touched by Jesus again does he see with clarity. It is not that Romero had no compassion for the poor before, nor that he did not take great measures to care for the poor. However, his conversion marks a new seeing, a new clarity about the reality in which he lived. John Sobrino, whose writings alone could be the subject of this presentation, also uses the visual, visual metaphor when stating that as our Archbishop Romero stood, gazing at the mortal remains of Frutilio Grande, the scales fell from his eyes. What Romero saw was that Frutilio died as Jesus died. Grande's ministry that took flesh among the poor of Aguilares was the one that more clearly reflected the following of Jesus and would then redirect Romero's ministry as Archbishop. As we have seen, in a certain respect, it is important to distinguish Romero's new sight from the turning away of, from sin. Martin Meyer, who uh, in his fine study of Romero's spirituality, concludes that Romero's conversion is best understood not as a turning from sin, but drawing from the rules uh, for discernment in the spiritual exercises as a movement de lo bueno a lo mejor, from the good to the better. This movement is characterized by a seeing anew, a radical change in understanding and putting into action the will of God. Certainly this echoes Romero's own opinion when asked about his conversion during the Salem meeting at Puebla. He said, to be converted is to turn to the true God. And in that sense, I feel that my contact with the poor, with the needy, leads to a growing sense of need for God. In this sense, then, I too seek conversion in order to be able to put my trust in God and through God be able to provide a word of consolation, a response to the poor's anguish, and if possible, point out the way to those who can resolve these predicaments. Clearly, the seeing anew that Romero experienced is a turning to God prompted by his encounter with the reality of poverty whether in Santiago de Maria or in the murders of Father Grande, Don Manuel, and young Tilo. However, I would argue that in our context, we not move too quickly away from the notion of a turning from sin and that we understand Romero's seeing, his growing sense of the need for God in relation to a profound realization of social sin. 
Now, it may be argued that this understanding is false because there is no expression of guilt by Romero. Nowhere in his speaking about his own change is there a formal repentance of social sin. And this echoes the concern of those who see in the concept of social sin an emptying out of notions of personal responsibility. While it is true that expressions of guilt regarding social sin are not present in Romero's accounts of his transformation, what is present is the necessity of a response. Romero's new vision, prompted by the reality of the poor, demanded a response of presence, of mercy. In his well-known lecture at Louvain, Romero, speaking about the church's incarnation in the world, comments on Exodus 3.9. These words have given us new eyes to see what has always been the case among us, but which has so often been hidden, even from the view of the church itself. For Romero, God's hearing the cry of the Israelites and seeing their suffering under the oppression of the Egyptians serve as a model for the church and challenges it to conversion and incarnation. Continuing on, he says, experiencing these realities and letting ourselves be affected by them, far from separating us from our faith, has sent us back to the world as to our true home. Romero's conversion signals a link between the realizing of social sin and an incarnation to confront that sin. This shifts the consideration of social sin from a juridical to a historical framework. It does not mean ignoring a sense of causal responsibility for social ills. Romero's realization of social sin in El Salvador and the corresponding form of repentance and action would be qualitatively different from that of the landed oligarch who refused to pay fair wages or the paramilitary who carried out acts of repression. Yet Romero's response forces us to reckon with what Kenneth Himes calls distributive moral responsibility, where liability for social sin can merit a response from a person even if there is not a direct responsibility as causal or culpability, kind of blameworthiness. The key we find in Romero is how that response takes historical flesh. Romero put it plainly in a homily of December 1979 noting, a rich person finds, a, finds conversion when they ask themselves, why am I rich while there are so many are, are poor around me? By viewing Romero's conversion as a realization of social sin, we can better account for that collective sense that the Bible calls the sin of the world. In the language of older moral theology, it is important that we do not deny the existence of material sin as the violation of God's will for the world, because we do not see formal sin as evil done with freedom, intent, and knowledge. This is affirmed by Ignacio Iacuria, who, using a distinction of Javier Zubiri, draws attention to historical sin by noting that what goes down in history isn't the intentionality of human acts, the opus operans, but the objective results of acts, the opus operatum. With this understanding of historical sin, we can understand the proper response of conversio, not just as a turning away from sin, but a turning back of sin itself. To put it liturgically, conversion means a historical participation in the work of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What we see in Romero is not just what John Sobrino calls an honesty with the real and a fidelity to the real but also how in a Christian spirituality this manifests itself in a historical following of the example of Jesus. This is the heart of the preferential option for the poor and constitutes a significant challenge to those who would receive the witness of Oscar Romero. Romero's conversion involves a seeing anew and part of that vision is a confrontation with the reality of social sin that demands a response. It demands a confessio that is not just the recognition of failings, but also the praise of God by making manifest God's reign, God's will for life and human flourishing in history. That response is best summed up as a prefer preferential option for the poor, but as powerful a suggestion as this may be, even it can be easily ideologized. Romero's new way of seeing and responding can too easily become 
a paternalistic charity that empties any voice, any agency from the other that is named poor. This is not the testimonio of Romero. For Romero's new vision led him to exercise power as service. It led him to seek advice. It led him to the silence of contemplation before the stories of those who hungered and thirst for justice, those who suffered persecution for the sake of the kingdom. In perhaps Romero's most eloquent account of his transformation, he describes it uh, as a return home. For, uh, forgive the length of this, but I think it's uh, worthy to read if, if you've not heard it before. It's just that we all have our roots, you know. I was born into a poor family. I've suffered hunger. I know what it's like to work from the time you're a little kid. When I went to seminary and started my studies and then they sent me to finish studying here in Rome, I spent years and years absorbed in my books and I started to forget about where I came from. I started creating another world. When I went back to El Salvador, they made me bishop's secretary in San Miguel. I was a parish priest for 23 years there, but I was still buried under paperwork. And when they sent me to San Salvador to be auxiliary bishop, I fell into the hands of Opus Dei, and there I remained. Then they sent me to Santiago de Maria, and I ran into extreme poverty again. Those children that were dying just because of the water they were drinking, those campesinos killing themselves in the harvests. You know, Father, when a piece of charcoal has already been lit once, you don't have to blow on it much to get it to flame up again. And everything that happened to us when I got to the archdiocese, what happened to Father Grande and all, it was a lot. You know how much I admired him. When I saw Rutilio dead, I thought, if they killed him for what he was doing, it's my job to go down that same road. So yes, I changed, but I also came back home again. Romero did have humble roots, and his return home is an odyssey from unreality back to a reality that he had forgotten or repressed. Yet he did not return to his childhood. The return home actually served as an unsettling of the home he had as he became archbishop, and a future that he could not anticipate. In this way, Romero's image of home has elements of what postmodern and postcolonial thinkers have called the unhomely. They take their cues from what Freud calls the unheimliche, that is, that species of the frightening that goes back to what was once well known and had long been familiar. Though most often uh, translated as uncanny, the unheimliche is literally unhomely. As unhomely, it is unsettling. It is a truth that a person must come to grips with even though they would wish to avoid it. This insight is given a political valence in Julia Kristeva's work where the title Strangers to Ourselves indicates the way that recognizing how strange I am to myself helps me to recognize how the strangeness of the other is not a threat to my own self-identity. For Homi Baba, the unhomely serves as the interruption of static identities and binaries that make up the colonial reality, the kind of binaries at the heart of a phrase like as patria mata un cura, be a patriot, kill a priest. Theologically, this notion of the unhomely resonates with what Johannes Metz, who seems to be cited in every paper, calls dangerous memories, those memories of the victims of history, those memories that undercut the triumphal narratives of the victors and indicate the interconnectedness of all subjects. Romero's return home actually involves the unhomely interruption of his role as archbishop and sets his ministry on a new course. Unhomeliness indicates how Romero did not become a, quote, voice of the voiceless, who reified in his position of power and independence, deploys his words in replacement or as an erasure of the voice of the poor. No, Romero becomes the voice of the voiceless by allowing those with no voice to speak their truth. Whether it was the interpersonal listening of the multitude of campesinos lined up to speak to him, while often leaving the bishop's conference waiting, 
or the homilies in the cathedral whose news of the week recounted the sufferings and stories of this repressed population, Romero let the unhomely reality of the poor interrupt uh, the flow of agency. Romero's return home is not the departure from one archbishop's or privileged world and a return to a clearly specified campesino or oppressed world, but really the blurring of that which would conceive of them as two distinct worlds. Both Romero's personal history and the very nature of his office were rooted in colonial relationships of power that configured them historically. His conversion then lies more clearly in the unhomely existence that blurs the opposition. And out of that creates a space for the archbishop to discover Oscar, for the church to be the pueblo de Dios. Romero's ecclesial motto, sentir con la iglesia, is interruptive as it blurs Romero's and the church's identities mm -hmm. and redirects them to incarnation and solidarity that makes manifest the reign of God. As Ignacio Iacuria put it, when the people resent, represented hardly anything to Romero, he hardly represented anything to the people, we used to say. Now we can add that when the people finally did become important to him, his announcement of the gospel finally had force. It was finally credible. It was not any force, but the evangelical force of salvation, the historical force of liberation. Let me conclude. I come here today from New York City, an area ravaged by a devastating storm. We are discovering that, much like John Sobrino's description of the 2001 earthquakes in El Salvador, Sandy serves as an x-ray for our area. It is a situation that calls for a conversion. For some, the conversion involves participation, not deferring a response to others more heroic, but to enact a response of mercy to those who lack power, who need food, and who need shelter. For others, the waters that inundated our city have washed away in innocence or ignorance and laid bare the reality that it is precisely those who lack power, not just electricity, who even before the storm did not have food, did not have shelter. Moreover, the process of bringing back electrical power to different areas has spoken volumes about who has power and who does not. Rather than simply conform to the rhetoric of getting back to normal, conversion involves the unhomely realization that normal was destructive and sinful. And in the best sense of the phrase, we need to cast our city's history in a new direction. I'll conclude with an image. In her diary, Jean Donovan talks about the powerful experience of standing guard by the body of Archbishop Romero before his funeral. It is appropriate. For if the legacy of Romero is a conversion and incarnation in the world of the poor, then the guardians of that testimonio here in the United States are those like Jean Donovan, Ida Ford, Dorothy Kazel, and Mara Clark. They witness not just against the more bellicose voices like Alexander Haig, Jean Kirkpatrick, and those who inherited their mantle, but those four women testify against the temptation to hide from the reality of the poor or rationalize it away. Finally, we can add the name of Dean Brackley, who in 1989 left my campus of Fordham to go to San Salvador. It was a going away and a going home for Dean. After his death, a mass on our campus was followed by a time of remembrances by those who worked in community organizing with Dean in the South Bronx. In their voices and their stories, Dean returned home again. Romero's testimonial is one of conversion. It is prophecy, it is politics, it is wisdom. For me, Romero's conversion offers hope that we might have eyes to see and ears to hear. However, it is not the conversion of Romero the liberal hero who single-handedly takes on the establishment, not a paternalistic Romero who saves a faceless poor through his largesse, not even an ecclesiastical Romero whose sanctity and fidelity are bleached of any real incarnation. No, his conversion is a journey of transformation that brought him to see all things anew in the face of social sin and led him home to the reality of a crucified people for whom 
in a preferential option, he entrusted his office, his voice, and ultimately his destiny. Hopefully we can, in our humble ways, receive his testimonio and stand with Jean, Ida, Mara, Dorothy, Dean, and the other cloud of witnesses. Thank you. Well, thank you to Father Scanone and to Matt and Michael for three really uh, terrific uh, inspiring and challenging papers. We've got 20 minutes now for a uh, question and answer, and um, I think, uh, Maria Clara, are you going to handle translation duties? So um, if anybody has a question for any one of the speakers, please. Yes, please. Broadly speaking, broadly speaking, if you want to think of it metaphorically, that's okay. I would just point out that we talk about God's will, um, and our usually way of thinking about will is making choices that happen in time. Um, so I, I think that uh, it's actually just as difficult to even talk about God knowing. I mean, there's all kinds of debates over whether, whether God knows future events. So uh, I guess my first response is that. Um, it's just as difficult to talk about God you know, in terms of other very human attributes. I think, for me, and I, and I follow, um, I learned from the other from this, we need to do it because Scripture does it. I mean, Scripture talks about God's memory quite clearly and about God forgetting, and, um, and that's where, um, and also if we, if we follow the point that uh, Todd Malachi made yesterday of learning from the saints, I guess we God says a saint that that he did it. So I, I sort of start from the, the imperative of, of doing justice to that. And um, but it then also realize the you know the the idea of analogy like metaphor, broadly speaking, is that there's as much unlikeness as there is likeness. And um, yeah, but that the like the, the likeness of what you're affirming is important and there are gains to be made. Adorno, uh, Horkheimer and Adorno both are responsible actually for um, taking uh, Benjamin's legacy. He committed suicide in 1940, I think, uh, as he was trying to escape the Nazis over the border from France into Spain. And um, uh, 
Horkheimer in particular was not not happy with um, Benjamin's use of theological terminology. Adorno was a little more willing to do it, but you know, I take the point of someone like a, a Jillian Rose or someone like that that finds the problem in their approach is that um, of the critical theory is that um, eventually the, the, the openness to possibility uh, of change becomes so constrained um, that in an ironic way, both Adorno and Horkheimer end up right back uh, where they uh, where they tried to get away from that is that the best we can do is sort of theorize about the future. I would like to say, um, and, and perhaps Carlos uh, Canone can respond to that, is that I think the kind of practices of memory was precisely what he was talking about in the, uh, because, um, and, I, and I was delighted, I didn't know this in advance, that the, one of the, the subjects would be um, Monsignor Angelelli and giving the context of memory for what, what he was doing. So. Um, and, and this is not me just trying to dodge the bullet and point it to someone else, but, but I think that part of what I learned, and again, if I could have in 30 seconds rewritten my paper, I would have, from his presentation was that obviously memory is incarnated in rituals and symbols, and that um, I think, uh, and also Agnes's uh, beautiful presentation yesterday in, in the Filipino, Filipino context. So I think one of them is the, uh, the power of popular religiosity um, is the way that it can incarnate these memories and keep them present, even though, quote unquote, they're not historical. Another, uh, another element I, I was very moved by was um, thinking about this whole issue of what counts as history is the, um, you know, the controversy over Rigoberta Menchú and, uh, and the sort of savaging of her you know, autobiography for being non-historical. So, so I think there are these kind of practices, but they emerge on the margins and, and often in the level of uh, popular uh, religious wisdom. And so I, I thank you. I'm looking up this way. <laughs> I should look at the camera. Thank you for that. Um, whether or not um, you, you think that uh, our talks illuminate one another, uh, that, that, that would be the, the direction that I would go. Okay. <risa> Hola. ¿Me escuchan? Sí, sí, ahora sí. ¿Y usted me escucha? Yo la escucho. Sí, bueno. Entonces, eh, no sé si entendió sí. lo que dijo Mancio. ¿Usted entendió lo que acaba de decir? ¿Cómo? No, porque <risa> le hicieron una pregunta. No. Sí. Eh, le hicieron una pregunta sobre la cuestión de la memoria, del misticismo de la memoria, sobre el cual él habló citando a Walter Benjamin, ¿no? Y él, después de responder parte de la pregunta, la remitió a usted, porque dijo <ríe> que lo que usted ha dicho en su ponencia es justamente la práctica de eso, ¿no? De uh, en un ritual, en una, toda una, sí, una tradición popular, cultural, hacer memoria y conectar eso con eh, la vida y el testimonio y el de Monsignor Angelelli, ¿no? Y entonces él pide que, si, si usted quiere, hable un poco sobre eso, ¿no? Sobre la cuestión de la memoria involucrada en ese rito del timpanaco timpanaco es una memoria al mismo tiempo que una leyenda porque hay un hecho histórico pero hasta donde todo lo que se dice es eh, así o real sin embargo la memoria del mestizaje violento pero al mismo tiempo fecundo, de tal manera que por eso se plasma en un encuentro. Y este encuentro se repite porque en la actualidad sigue siendo válido. Sobre todo, una memoria en ese, ese, subversiva en cuanto que subvierte los desvalores de injusticia y de falta de reconciliación que todavía de hecho se dan 
en la Rioja y en mi país y en América Latina. De tal manera que, eh, por un lado, es una memoria que funda, funda una, un mestizaje que es realmente, digamos, algo nuevo y fecundo. Por otro lado, integra a lo que no se realiza, ¿no? según esa memoria, sino al contrario, la ofende y abre futuro, llama para luchar por la justicia, por la reconciliación y sobre todo esa opción preferencial por los pobres. Gracias. Voy a traducir. A ver si traducir. Voy a traducir, sí, sí. sí. Um, it's a memory and a legend, so what he um, told us. It's a historical fact, but the, the memory... Uh, you don't hear? No, no escucha? Uh, yeah. It's a nature story, it's a historical fact, but the memory of the mestizaje, it's mixing, mixing, the mixing, um, about the, the violent mixing, um, is, it's at the same time a fertile encounter, mm -hmm. and the, the memory uh, subverts the the counter values that are there of injustice, a lack of reconciliation, etc. So, he resumed at the end. The memory founds um, a new and fertile mixing. Second, um, the, uh, the memory rescues and uh, cleans, heals what uh, it's not yet realized in terms of conversion of desire and third the memory opens the future and uh, invites to continue to struggle uh, against poverty against injustice which is a very uh, concrete reality still in La Rioja and in Argentina and in Latin America Está bien? Bien su, ¿eh? Muy bien. Bueno, eh, yo quería preguntar algo al padre Scanone. Pregunto primero en español, después traduzco en inglés. Si no me vuelvo loca hoy, nunca más. Eh, usted es un gran especialista en la filosofía de Manuel Levinas. Um, yo he leído algo de su filosofía y la aprecio mucho también. Um, muchos filósofos han sido citados en esa conferencia, pero no este. Y sin embargo me parece que su filosofía, sobre todo en algunos de sus libros, notadamente en Otto Monquetre o Delà de l'Essence, tocan puntos que son muy importantes para lo que estamos hablando aquí sobre testimonio en términos de tomar sobre sí eh, los sufrimientos de los demás, etc. Entonces, si usted puede hablar algo sobre eso, pero espere un poquito que traduzco a la pregunta que le hice. Uh, Father Scanone is a great specialist in the philosophy of Emmanuel Levinas. A Jewish, Lithuanian, French philosopher of the 20th century, and uh, I, according to what I read about on Levinas, I think his philosophy is very adequate to ground what we are discussing here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I saw in this conference many philosophers mentioned and worked and thought and discussed, but not his philosophy. He has a book. Make a, we have many books that touch on that, but mainly, I think the most important is Otto Monquette, Outre de la Adolescence. I don't, it's, it's certainly translated in English, but I don't know the title in English, where he develops a whole conception of um, every, every human being being Messiah by the capacity of taking over uh, himself or herself, the sufferings of others, etc. Then I, I asked Father Stanoni if he could speak a little bit about that. 
En América Latina, la filosofía de la liberación, Enrique Dussel, yo mismo, otros, hemos referido a Levinas, pero de una forma más bien social, política, histórica y aún conflictiva. El mismo Levinas, algunas de estas cosas no las aceptaba. Hemos tenido conversaciones con él en París, etc. Pero en el fondo tomamos el tema de Levinas porque él plantea la interpelación del pobre, el rostro del pobre, y toma la expresión bíblica, el pobre, el extranjero, el huérfano y la viuda. Pero nosotros lo vimos a nivel ya de social e histórico, como le decía antes. Pero creo que hay muchísimo que aprender de Levinas. Y de hecho, por ejemplo, Enrique Dulce, en toda su filosofía, retoma en su ética muchísimo de Levinas, dándole una visión desde América Latina. Y sobre todo, nosotros habíamos usado mucho totalidad e infinito. Pero otra mente que ser, o más allá que la esencia, ahí él dice que es la opción por el otro hasta la sustitución. Y no solamente la sustitución por la víctima, sino aún por el victimario. Es decir, que tiende en último término a la paz y la reconciliación en la justicia. Y pienso que tiene mucho lo que decir, sobre todo si nosotros lo leemos ya con ojos sociales, estructurales y políticos. Padres Canón has told me told that in Latin America uh, the liberation philosophy, the most uh, important representatives are Enrique Duso and Padres Canón, um, have worked a lot on Levinas but it, with the Latin American perspective in a social form, assuming conflictive uh, point of view on history. And that was very much discussed, and even the same Levinas didn't accept that very well. They had a conversation with Levinas in Paris, in Paris and uh, Levinas was not fully in, a, uh, in agreement with that point of view. But, uh, well, they, thought that this philosophy was adequate for uh, doing liberation uh, thought on reality, on Latin American reality, because Levinas puts the question of the face of the poor, um, assuming inside this category of poor, the biblical categories, the poor, the orphan, the, the widow, the stranger. Uh, so uh, he thinks that there is a lot to learn from Levinas. Um, Dusso, he, he says that Dusso um, rescues Levinas' philosophy, giving it a vision um, from the perspective of Latin America. Um, Dusso and Scannone worked a lot on uh, the what is considered the major work of Levinas, totality and infinite. But he thinks that Otto uh, Monquette, the book I mentioned, is very important because there there is an option for the other um, till the replacement, substitution hmm, of the other for the victim and for the perpetrator. Hmm. And that is, um, he thinks, it's an important point that should be thought in the context of Latin America, injustice, uh, conflict, etc. Thank you very much to the three speakers for the engaging presentations. My question is uh, addressed to Michael. So you mentioned that in 2010 there was a move to remove the memory of Monero in the US textbooks, mm -hmm. uh, which suggests that this story is really dangerous memory. Um, 
No, I would like, well, Romero uh, asked the U.S. government to stop with support to the military of El Salvador. So I would like you to elaborate further on how this story of memory of U.S. intervention in El Salvador is being transmitted to the young Not well. Um, I mean, how it's being transmitted. It was just, uh, now the years are beginning to pass, but it was the uh, vice presidential debate, um, Dick Cheney's second one, in which he held up El Salvador, that memory as a model for U.S. intervention while justifying Iraq and Afghanistan. So, uh, the way that memory gets repeated um, is not good. That, that specific case in, in Texas was more, uh, I think, out of ignorance. Um, particular board member just simply said, well, I've never heard of it, so why are you in Texas? <laughs> um, um, but, but, but I think it, it's crucial, and, and, and what I find um, is that for many people, oh, come on, El Salvador, really? Still, uh, there, there's so much else in the world. A and that is true, but um, at least I find that students, uh, the United States involvement there is in, in, in the billions of dollars um, in so much violence and repression that we have an IOU, and um, it's, it's not right that uh, that uh, 20, uh, 20 plus years ago, a congressman could stand up and say, El Salvador is at the center of our um, interests around the globe. And then now we can just forget and place the center somewhere else. Um, I, I think the lessons are, are, are there. Um, and, and it is powerfully striking. And, and on the good side, it is powerful to speak, uh, to tell Dean Dunham's story um, to uh, college students. Uh, seven years old. Yeah, she was a graduate of Case Western, a finance major, she had a good job, a motorcycle, all of this, and, and students nod their heads and yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I like, that's what I want. And, th and then I say to them, but then she said to herself, this has got to be more. And, and it's there that she begins that journey that, that so I, I think it's a um, it's, it's a particularly relevant one. Your question was, is it being told? How is it being told? And, and um, a difficult question to answer, but my impression is it's, it's not very well um, in many places. Um, but one hopes that this gatherings like this, reflection like this, um, this is why memories and testimonies are told and, and kept alive because because it, it's still so important and still so relevant. Well, Padre Scanone, Matthew and Michael, muchísimas gracias por compartir su sabiduría con nosotros. Please join me in uh, thanking uh, <laughs>